This is the, the profound question the Prophet's asking him because it's an inroad, it's a way in. It's something that we don't do. We don't do much of at least anyway. The Prophet is asking him, are you married? Julaib says, come on, a Prophet of Allah, how could I be married? I don't even have friends, I don't even have companions that would bother to spend time with me, to salute me, to, you know, to have a, a companionship with me, let alone having an intimate friend. And the Prophet then, he said, you know, uh, the Prophet made an effort to marry this man off to a, a wonderfully pious woman, and that's another story itself. But what makes this so relevant to our talk today is the fact that we have no other narration of Junaibi. Out of the corpus of Hadith literature, there is nothing else except one that I, in my very limited knowledge, have ever come across. And this is a Hadith in Sahih Muslim. When the Prophet of Allah, coming from an expedition, asked his companions, هَلْ تَفْقِيُونَ مِنْ أَحَدْ Are you missing anything? And they said, yeah, yeah, we miss this, this, and that person. The Prophet asked the second time, are you missing anybody? They said, yeah, we miss this, this, and that person. The Prophet asked the third time the same question. They said, no, no, we miss nobody else. Now we've counted everybody. Either they're killed in the battle, or they're imprisoned, uh, or they're back home with us. That's it. What did the Prophet say? I miss Julaibi, so go and find him. I miss Julaibi, so go and find him. The people went to find him. They found him. He was killed. The Prophet of Allah was called to him. The Prophet began to weep. And the Prophet pointed to him and he said, This man is from me and I am from him. This man is from me and I am from him three times. Then the narrator says, For Allah wa la sa'idayhi, he placed you the on his arms. Wa laysa lahu sarin, and he says it has no, he had no pillow on that day, except the arms of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It begins on a very human level. We're not talking about great philosophies or great ethics. It's quite simple, more simple than that. It's about simple humanity, expressions. We tend to live in our cliques. Everybody is kind of fragmented, we're living in our small groupings, right, our own gangs, our own sects or cults, and that's how it is. And so we tend to have no time for anybody else, right? It's about me and my few four or five people with me, and, and then that's it. But what did the Prophet teach us here about justice? Two human beings, it's about having an, inclu an inclusivity about you being inclusive, right, in bringing people in, thinking and worrying about those that other people don't worry about. Our focus should be, and this is the concern of Prophet, it's not simply the concern of our Prophet, peace be upon him, Muhammad, peace be upon him, it's the concern of all Jesus spent his time with lepers, spent his time with poor people, spent his time with those who were born diseased and ill. That's where his concern was, Moses, John the Baptist, David, Solomon, our Prophet, all of them spent their time with those who were not well off, distant, divorced in society. And that is a great concern, a great ethic of justice that we must try and incorporate in ourselves. Quite amazing that now people speak about uh, great ideals like restorative justice. Right? And that in fact is, is, is there's a good book called Pitty, Picking Cotton, if, if you guys have get a chance to read. It's a true story about a man with the surname, surname Cotton a black individual in America who was accused of raping a white woman, um, you know, about three decades ago. And he spent more than two and a half or three decades in prison for a crime he did not commit. The woman just took him in, in the kind of a in the lineup. He came out of prison and he forgave that woman. He forgave that woman and in fact they became close friends. And then a book was written called Picking Cotton About the Whole Experience. And you think, well, this is quite amazing, the restorative justice. What does Allah, the Lord of the heavens and earth, tell us in the Quran? Repel evil with good. Right? This is your road to justice. Repel evil with good. If you repel evil with good, what will happen? Something amazing, transformative will happen. Allah says in the Quran, what will happen is that between you and the one that you have a problem with, you become as if you're close friends. You become as if you're close friends. Meaning the purpose should be, not that we have this 
perpetual, uh, permanent enmity between people. No, there has to be a time when we want to restore things. The Prophet of Allah, his focus was on what building and not destroying. He took this man, Uqbat ibn Amr, he brought him close, he said, Ya Uqbat ibn Amr. That's the man's name, he said, Oh Uqbat ibn Amr. Three things. If you can practice them, I mean, you'll be great in your lives. Ya Uqbat ibn Amr, sin man qata'ak. Join with those who break off with you. I mean, who could do that? Who could join relations with the one that's broken off with them? You might think, no. The blame is on the one that's broken off with me. Why should I make an effort? The Prophet taught us not to be passive. If you really want human society to work, you want friendships, you want relationships to build and strengthen, you would take the active role and not be passive. Right? As if you know, the, the world owes you something, a favor. The world owes none of us anything. But we owe the world something. He says, Ya Rabbi Ibn Amr, Wa'ati man haraman, and give to those who deny you. You might think, well, if I'm being denied, why should I give to those who... Well, that's the thing. You want to be the great, the great human being, you will take the active role. Lastly, Wa'afu anna al-ghalamak, and pardon those who wrong you. And again, you might think, if I'm being wrong, why should I pardon those who wrong me? Well, that's the Islamic paradigm then. That's the Islamic ethic. It's about you taking the step to create that sense of justice in society. So we believe in things like restorative justice because that is what the Prophet of Allah spoke about. In fact, on the authority of Abdullah ibn Salam, who was the chief of the rabbis, Jewish individual in Medina, who became a Muslim later, he said, Oh, what a she in Samaritan who called the first thing I heard the Prophet say when he arrived in Medina. Think about this projection. Projected. This is the first thing that he's hearing the Prophet say. Oh, what a she in. The first thing I heard him say was, What? Afshis Salam, spread peace. Afshis Salam, wa'at'im al-ta'am, and feed people. Right? That is a, that is a labor, that is a, a human effort, a human work on everyone. Everybody has that responsibility. Simple, feed people. Well, sinim and qata'ak, and join relations with those who cut them off with you. Or join relations with your near of kin. Right? And, you know, feed the prisoners. And pray in the night when the people are asleep and you will enter paradise in peace. <laughs> Amazing, beautiful message. Right? It's quite interesting. This is talk is happening in March. You know, I, I guess some of you are probably thinking, oh, Harriet Tubman <laughs> died in 1913 on March the 10th. Right? We are days away from her centennial. The world all over, particularly those who are interested or have a connection to black American, African American history, would remember her. I remember her, I have a, but I remember because I, there is a, a, a greatness in ideal and justice found in that woman, unlike what you would ever find in Anna Nicole Smith or Britney Spears or anybody else like that. Well, based upon images, aesthetics, right? Without the lighting, without the clothing, without the makeup artist, without the clothing artist, without the red light, the, the red carpet, without the music to accompany their arrival. Those individuals are worthless. They fail to be what we now call celebrities or stars, for example. <laughs> they fail to be that. Harriet Tubman was a woman who rescued black individuals, black slaves in America. She was a conductor of the Underground Railway Movement, the conductor, right? She would travel 400 miles on foot to reach safety. And she took those trips back and forth, back and forth. And she has to her credit the rescuing of more than 700 slaves. She said, I could have freed more of them if they knew that they were slaves. <laughs> if they knew that they were slaves. Right? February 22nd, 1943, just a few weeks ago, we remembered, we should have remembered, the importance of Sophia Shaw. Right? The 22-year-old German woman, part of the White Rose resistance movement against Hitler. And she paid for it with her life under the guillotine on February, exactly 70 years ago, from last week, February 22nd. We remember that. Why? There was a time, in fact, during her days when they give her a small column, this is some kind of youth activist who's, you know, challenging the Fuhra, the, the Emperor, Hitler, whatever. Today in Germany there are more than 190 schools named in memory of Sophia Scholl and her brother Hans Scholl. The old school, in fact, was called Ulm Gymnasium. It's now called Hans and Sophia Scholl Gymnasium, right? There's Spiegel in Poland, I think, in 2006, 
to ascertain the greatest German woman and man in German history, they voted Sophia Scholl as number one, being the greatest German woman in German history. Simply based upon an act of resistance that was just, when most people were simply concerned about the, you know, they had the three case, culture, culture, kingdom, whatever, kitchen and uh, children and uh, what else? The kitchen, uh, the church. <laughs> as long as you can pray and you can cook and you can have children to be, to raise, well, that's good enough. Don't worry. Under your noses, you know, people are being gassed to death. People at Sophia Shaw had that concern. Malcolm X died the next day, in fact, 1960, well, 68, February 22nd, right? So people also thought, thought about me. There are so many things that are happening that have a connection to justice and how people uh, dealt with matters of injustice in human society. The Prophet of Allah in one hadith, he says, I'm speaking fast simply because the brother told me I have only 10 minutes, I'm trying to get everything I wanted to say in like a <laughs> He said, Beware of injustice. Why? Beware of injustice because injustice is darkness is on the day of judgment. It's darkness is on the day of judgment. A famous hadith. This is a hadith. Hadith means tradition of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Hadith Qudsi, meaning it's coming from Allah Himself to the Prophet, to us. Where the Prophet of Allah began by saying that Allah said, Ya ibadi my servant. I have forbidden injustice on myself. God says that. God says, Allah says, I have forbidden injustice upon myself, and I have forbidden the same amongst you. So do not be unjust to one another. Then one of the narrators of this hadith, Abu Idris al Khawlani, when he would narrate this hadith, he would kneel on the floor because it was so great. It's a long hadith that continues, but this is how it begins with a simple message about justice. In remembering people like Harry Tubman, remembering Malcolm X, right? Remembering, I agree with all these people, honestly, that if you've ever read Emmett Till, I just pulled the book on Emmett Till, the killing of my 1955 of a boy, 15 years old, 14 years old in America. But it was his mother, Maya, Right, who decided to have an open casket for her son who was disfigured. I mean, they disfigured him. These white individuals disfigured him. They cut him up. They smashed his face in, and then they killed him. And they threw him in a river. The, the body was brought out. His mother, as an act of protest, said, I want him to be displayed in the church with an open casket. And he said, why? They said, one third of people who entered the church came out having fainted or having a problem because they couldn't deal with the scene. But she realized, no, it's your act of injustice that's created this. This thing that we find so repulsive is coming from you. You should see it, therefore. It's about challenging status quo. There was an individual in time with the Prophet himself called Bilal al-Habashi. Al-Habashi, his name was Bilal. He was an African slave. He was Ethiopian. And his slave masters, he Arab nobility of Quraysh would torture him, they would oppress him, they would whip him and command him to do disgusting things. But when he heard about the religion of Islam and the Prophet was living amongst him, he couldn't believe. What does Allah say in the Quran? Ya ayyuhan nas, not like, oh you believe, oh people, <laughs> oh people, oh civilization, oh humanity. Inna khalaqnakum min dhakrin wa unta we have created you from a male and a female. Wa ja'alnakum shi'uba wa qaba'ina we have made you into nations and tribes. What for? Lita'arafu so that you might know one another. And Bilal saw in that verse something that penetrated his heart. Because before it was based upon, no, hold on. You have ethnic distinctions, you have color based differentiation, you have People who are poor, people who are rich, all these things happening, but no, this, this verse came to show us what? People are different. This is from Wamin Ayati, from the signs of Allah, the creation of different colors of your skin and different languages you speak are something you will marvel at, not something that you will despise. And this is 1400 years in the Quran. And for Bilal, it was a big thing. And so the Prophet changed all of that. There was an occasion, in fact, when Bilal had some kind of altercation with another companion called Abu Dhab. You know, if you think I mean too fast, it's going to tell me so. Called Abu Dhab. 
Right? And Abu Dhabi said to Bilal, Yemna Sauda, O oh, son of a black woman. O oh, son of a black woman. You can see perhaps if you look at the nuances of his statement, you know, his, 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 his uh, remark isn't simply focused on Bilal, it's said to his mother. Right? Son of a black woman. And it's not simply by the color of his skin because incidentally Abu Dhabi himself was very dark in comparison. <laughs> So it has to be something else. It's about, look where you're coming from, O oh Bilal. And they're both Muslim, but they're early new Muslims. They didn't know too much. When Bilal was so upset by that statement, he went to the Prophet and he said, Look, O oh Prophet, this is what Abu Dhar said to me. He said, O oh, son of a black woman, the Prophet said to Abu Dhar, Ya Abu Dhar, O Abu Dhar, inna kibra'an fika jahiliya. You are a man within you still ignorant. Within you is still ignorance. Abu Dhar was so moved by that and felt troubled. He said to Bilal, Bilal, place your foot on my skin. Place your foot on my on my cheek. I will lie on the floor. Place your foot on my cheek. Bilal said to this is a restorative justice, by the way. He said, Oh Abu Dhar, that is a cheek that deserves to be kissed, not trodden on by my foot. That is an ideal. That is ethic. That is justice. And the Prophet showed all of that. To his companions. You know, so we have an amazing example. What tends to happen? Young people, such as great people like yourselves, you know, you, we all come to this stage in our lives of uh, relative independence, isn't it? Where we're young, or we're youth, or we have youthfulness within us, and we own some of our own money, we make money, and you know, we have our own clothes, and we can buy our own gadgets and our stuff like that. We think this is. Like, we think we're living in a state of independence from everybody else. That's it. I'm independent from my parents. Even though early on we were completely dependent, isn't it? You, know, you needed your mothers and, and, your, and your fathers and your, your aunts and uncles and these to care for you, to clothe you, to feed you, to change you, to do all these kind of things. And then you get to that stage of youth and you think yourself to be independent, you don't need anybody else anymore. And then you revert back to the first stage that Allah described in the Quran. You go back to the beginning. If you reach old age, where you're again, once again, dependent. You wish people would look after you because you can't walk, or you have Alzheimer's disease, or you have some kind of another chronic illness, right? And you wish you had people look after you. The most important stage in your life, of course, would be the middle one. It's the stage where you think you have some kind of a pseudo. Uh, Semi-independence. No, the fact the, 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 the Quran emphasizes you're always dependent. You're always dependent. Right? And essentially you're dependent upon Allah. But the Quran gives such a position to those who looked after you when you were once dependent, when you were infants, that they joined in the Quran. They joined. Allah said in the Quran, Yeah, your word has ordained for you that you would worship none except God. Allah. And that you would show excellence to your parents. And so you see how they come to be joined. You would show excellence to your parents. That if one of them or both of them reach old age, this is the Quranic instruction. If one or both reach old age, you wouldn't even say uff to them. Meaning you wouldn't even scold them. You wouldn't even show dissatisfaction to them. What would you reprimand them? But say unto them generous good words. And spread the wings of mercy unto them. And say unto them, may my Lord have mercy on both of you. On both of them, the way that they look after you. Or you looked after me when I was Small, right? But a man came to the Prophet and says, uh, "You know, who is uh, who is more deserving of my good companionship, O Prophet of Allah?" Right? And the Prophet said to him, "Ummah, your mother is." The man said, "You know, okay, well, who next?" And after my mother, and again, the, the Prophet said, "Your mother is." Then the third time, the man said, "Well, who next?" And the Prophet, and again, the Prophet said, "Your mother is." And again, the, the, the man said, who after that? Is it then your father? <laughs> Meaning, you are not independent. You know, your mother's your sister. If you Christ graduate, and I hope you all do, it will seem as if your mother, if they are alive, and God bless them, 
it will seem as if your months have graduated, will it not? What if you guys flop and you fail? It will seem as if your mothers and your fathers have also failed. Right? And it's purely what you want to date. Allah says, thank me and thank your parents. They come to be joined in the Quran. And that is a beautiful and an amazing thing. You're right. <laughs> I was worried, I think. No, I stick a bit. No, I lie. Look. Look. <laughs> In the Quran, all right, you get a discussion about impediments. Because you might think, you know, I want to be just, but you know, I hate this person. I thought I'd be just. Well, you might think, yeah, I'm just, but I'm, I love this person so much, I can't see any injustice from them, even though they like it. Could be a nice murder or whatever. In the Quran, we have both things discussed beautifully. Allah said, Quran, ya you the dina and the oh, you believe. Kuna kawa mina bil kisti shuhada lina. Oh, you believe. Stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to God, to Allah. Walau ala nafsik, even if it's against yourself. Awul walidin, or it's against your parents. Walla qarabin, or your near of kin. Inya kun ghaliyan or fakira, whether they're rich or poor, makes no difference. The point is, stand out firmly for justice, even though you might love yourself so much, I can't do any wrong, possibly. No, because I'm whatever. Or you love your parents or your American, whatever, too much. But the Quranic paradigm is what? You would always stand forth for justice, irrespective of any potential impediment of love. What if it's the other way around? What if it's hate? Now look at the other verse in the Quran. It's amazing how you look at the subtleties in language. Ya ladina amin, or you believe. Kunu qawamina lillah. Stand up firmly for Allah. Shuhada bin Qis. As witnesses to justice. So the first one was what? Stand up firmly for justice as witnesses to Allah. Second one is what? Stand up firmly for Allah. This is a more kind of a, uh, you know, a, a more difficult one perhaps. Stand up firmly for Allah as witnesses to justice. But the focus here is on God Himself. And do not let the hatred of the people swerve you from being just. Be just. And that is closest to piety. Right? So you have these two verses in the Quran, one that deals with the, with the impediment of love and the other dealing with the impediment of hatred. So you, you could find situations where you might hate somebody, you might love somebody, you might love yourself. But the, the Quranic paradigm is to always be just, even if it's going against yourself. Right? The Quranic paradigm is to always stand out for those who are victims of injustice. In fact, in the Quran, a very beautiful verse in the Quran, when Allah says, It is not the essence of piety that you would turn your face towards east or west, right? Now, this verse was revealed in Surah Al-Baqarah based upon the tafsir of Imam Fakhradin al-Razi rahimullah. His explanation of this verse is that this verse was revealed because the Prophet's companions became so happy when the Qibla, direction of the prayer, was changed from Jerusalem to Mecca. And they became ecstatic, euphoric. You know, this is brilliant because Mecca, of course, is our homeland. It's wonderful. This verse was revealed saying what? It is not the essence of piety that you would turn your face towards east or west. But piety is that you believe in Allah, you believe in God at the last day, and His angels, and His book, and His prophets. And then what? What after the, all the belief elements? That you would give your money out of love for Allah, out of love for God, for the miskeen, for the poor, and for the orphans, right? And for your near of kin, and for the sa'ihin, and for those who ask you. And those who simply ask. I mean, how many times do we simply turn people away? Now, this, is, this is a framing of catastrophe. You know, honestly, if you study the whole thing, you'd be quite 
alarmed at how the whole thing works. Some victims in the world are worthy victims, others are unworthy. Some are ideal, others are like being ideal. Right? We tend to give to those who like, you know, are worthy enough to give to. What about the other poor world? Well, like in the 1990s, people didn't remember Liberia, people forgot the region, people forgot Sierra Leone. And their struggles and that genocide, Rwanda, these things became like, well, you know, this is why Neil Postman, if you bother to read his books, you'd see him, I mean, the, the guy died a few years ago. But, you know, you can, you can now see the resonations of what he was saying. If it's all in the framework of a news, mainstream news that has music, that has a kind of, you know, a, a stage, and everything else, it would diminish the quality of information, not only that, but it would desensitize you to the suffering of others. Right? Because you're seeing so many and it's all happening too fast and you're just kind of uh, passive recipients, but that is another discussion. All together, there's also another discussion. But the point is this, you would care for those who are less. I remember, you know, I went for Hajj, alhamdulillah, this, last, this year, this, this Hajj. And we were in the camps in Minna, tents in Minna. And what actually happened is that our AC wasn't working too well. In fact, it wasn't even working at all. It was like blowing a hot air. And was being too hot. Was like, oh, it was really hot. You know. Could you clarify what Hajj is? Yeah, Hajj is, of course, a pilgrimage that Muslims make to Mecca. Uh, and that is done, of course, in remembrance of the great legacy and sacrifice of Abraham and his son Ishmael and his why Hajar, 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 and the whole difficulty and the whole thing, so we're kind of uh, emulating that struggle, so we're in men, and it's so hard, and I remember, when I remember, we were, when we went back into the coast of the living men, we were going traveling past the King Prince Faisal Bridge, and there were people under the bridge, in the heat of day, right, under the bridge, and they're performing the rituals under the bridge, and there's like garbage, and it must have smelled bad, and all these things are there, and I just remember the thing, I told the rest of the group, and I thought, I remember a book, in fact, right, by a man called Tadeusz Borowski, who survived Auschwitz, and he wrote a book called, the, he wrote a book called, Ladies and Gentlemen, This Way to the Gas Chambers, and the focus here was on the last chapter of his book called The World as Stone, right, and all he does is he simply takes a, right, he, you know, this is much, much later after the Holocaust, and he's, Traveling, he's taking us to, he's taking us through what he's doing, and he's taking a, 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 a taking a walk down a, a bad area. It smells bad, and it, he can hear bad sounds, and he can see horrible things. But the whole rationale for all of that is, by the end of it, what does he say? Although I see bad things, I'm grateful I can see. <laughs> and although I hear bad things, I'm grateful I can hear. And although I smell bad things, I'm grateful I can smell. It doesn't mean that we go out of our way to go and smell bad things and hear bad things. No. It simply means what Allah says in the Quran, Alam Najahallahu Have we not given man two eyes? What he said and what should attain, we've given him a lip and two and we give him two lips and a tongue. And we've shown him the way of good and the way of bad. We've shown him all of that. But then what is the problem? He doesn't climb the hill that is ascending and is steep. And what will explain to you what is the hill that is steep and ascending? What is it, people? It is ransoming a person. It is ransoming a slave. It is freeing someone from bondage and captivity. Or feeding a person on a day of your own hunger. And who could do that? Who would do that? Who should do that? Who could feed a person on a day of their own hunger? Yatim and them, akraba or miskin and them, atraba. And yatim, an orphan from your nerve kin, or a poor man lying in the dust. Allah says, Thumma kana min al If you could do that, then you will be of those who believe. It is not simply about rhetoric and empty words and slogans and things that we believe because we're convinced of them and we're supposed to believe them. 
But in our religion, there is an amazing paradigm of justice. Justice to yourself, to your neighbors, to animals. It's horrendous. You, know, you find sometimes these horrendous stories of people who torture cats and dogs. There was a story of a man who kept swinging the cat around and, and smashed its head on a wall. People will stick their cats in microwaves and cook them to death. And you find it horrible and disgusting and disgusting and insane things that people do to those things that have life. The Prophet of Allah, Muhammad, peace be upon him, told us about a woman who was sent to hell because she imprisoned a cat and didn't allow that cat a chance to catch its own food and nor did she feed that cat. But at the same time, the Prophet of Allah told us about a woman who was a prostitute, who was a loose woman. But one day she happened to see a dog who was so thirsty it would have died. And there was a well nearby and she brought some water and she gave that dog some water to drink and she was forgiven. It is not simply about one thing or another, it's about having that comprehensive approach towards our faith, towards Islam, and being just and standing up for those who are oppressed. Right? The movement of dissent was popular in the 1930s in America, 1960s. It, you know, it was popular. It is today the anti imperialism league, the anti, I mean, Mark Twain, right? King Leopold of, uh, where was it? Africa. Who remembers? You know, where, wasn't it Sweden, I think, that had a colony there? King Leopold, sorry? Belgium. Belgium. Belgium, you're right, Belgium. So what, what was their land in Africa that they had? Angola? Not Angola, no. I can't even remember that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it wasn't, no. <laughs> <laughs>
anything, it would have been really good to perhaps, this would be a good opportunity to actually ask that. So, are there any questions? Not one. Okay, look, I tell you something. One of, one of the, the, the biggest problems facing all of us is the fact that we live in an altitude. We live in an altitude. All right? What does that mean? The fact that, I guess this is a remarkable, what is, if you just trajectory, I mean, just trace the whole thing, how it all happened, how we get to where we are now, right? Christmas past us. You know, in Christmas time, you tend to remember what consumption, consumerism, is it? Because you're buying and buying and buying. The jingle bells, in fact, start around the end of October. <laughs> so they prepare you for the Christmas spirit. And that is simply, you're just going to buy and buy and buy. If you buy things with money you don't have, and you buy things you don't need. But human beings were not always about buying, based upon buying things they don't, uh, they don't need. They would buy things that they, they need. Right? The 18th century is why Neil Postman wrote a book called Building the Bridge of the 18th Century because it, because it was simply pure. People would buy things that they needed to buy rather than buying things that they want to buy. And in wanting to buy due to public, due to, you know, uh, marketing and other campaigns, you're, you have this sense of, if I buy the product, it would confer some kind of happiness upon me. And so buying is based upon making me feel happy buying. That's why you would spend and spend and spend and be in debt and everything else. Because you think you could extrapolate, extract from the products happiness itself. But that is a new phenomenon. Right? That wasn't a thing of the past. People were going to buy sensibly on things that they needed. Right? In terms of Jean Baptiste Colbert under King Louis XIV, when you had this whole idea about branding products, because France couldn't keep up with Holland and Poland and England, right? And so King Louis had this novel idea where he said, well look, we need to make France what Spain has of gold mines in Peru. And people are amazed about Spain because it has gold mines in Peru. If we make <coughs> fashion the same kind of thing, people would be so inspired, right, about the brand. And so it began to brand products. That's what it is today, right? Aldous Huxley, in the 1930s, spoke about that, about a kind of engineered or planned obsolescence. You're buying things that are designed to break, right? They're created imperfect, although that's not perfect, but you get what I'm saying, right? You have to have the, in the machine of the industry has to continue to run. You would keep spending. You don't need to spend, but you would keep doing it because you're just, in the words of Walter Lippmann, what are you? The bewildered herd. I mean, he gave us that name in the 1920s. <laughs> You're supposed to be a bewildered herd. You're nothing, right? You have the elites who would run society, and you're supposed to be the bewildered herd. And he says, at best, you'd be people of spectacle. At best, right? So we'll let them vote, and they think they're doing something, that they're voting to bring people in. Well, are you really doing that? You know, do you have a say on the global affairs of the world? Can you have an influence on foreign policy? Walter Lippmann, they're saying these kind of things much, much earlier. Right? That we would narrow our focus and become a people of consumption and consumerism. Why do you think Scott Fitzgerald wrote books like The Great Gatsby? Or Ray Bradbury wrote Fahrenheit 451? Or wrote people, books like Brave New World? Or famously enough, George Orwell wrote 1984? Right? It wasn't simply about a society <coughs> of constraint and surveillance. The book becomes famous, of course, after the Cold War, after 9-11, people want to think, oh, we have cameras zooming on us. Aldous Huxley's projection was what? You wouldn't actually have cameras zooming on you. You would push yourself forth to be seen by all the cameras. Right? The kind of YouTube culture, the more outlandish you are, the more views you're going to get. Do something crazy, innate and you become famous overnight, right? That is the whole thing. What has happened, we live in an altitude. We live in our own height. Allah says in the Quran, this is about justice, okay? Allah says, 
Don't turn your cheek away from people in conceit or in disgust. Right? And don't walk in the earth with insolence. Don't walk in the earth with arrogance. You cannot reach by your own stature, your own height, the height of the mountains. And nor can you penetrate in the earth with your heaviness. Allah does not love any arrogant boasting. So the focus there is in what? For us to understand all these great ideals, ethics about justice, about you know, decency to human beings, humanity, you need to not live in an altitude. There is nothing that makes you better than anybody else. Look at the formula in the Quran when Allah says that, O oh people, we have created you from male and female, like I said before, nations and tribes, the most noble of you are those who are the most pious of you. That is it. That is the formula of success. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be the on the Hajj itself, on the mountain of Arafah, what did he say? There is no virtue of an Arab over an Arab. Nor is there a virtue over a black man over a white man. Or a white man over a black man. No virtue, illa taqwa, except by the scale of a person's piety, his good human disposition directed towards the pleasure of God. That is what you call piety. That is what makes you good in the sense of being good. Nothing else. Right? So we can't live in a sense of altitude because then you cannot recognize injustice. You can never do that. You can never recognize it just if you live in an altar. It's about being humble. It's about having the, the wrappings and garments of humility upon it. That's what the Quran calls to us. About living in a state of humility and humbleness. So Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was a humble individual. Right? He would always pray, Allah maja'anni, oh Allah make me amongst those. Not that I am. Allah maja'anni min at oh Allah make me amongst those who are repentant. Repentful and make me, make me among those who are purified. Make me among them. He would spend time with orphans. Right? Look at justice. A man once came to him. Right? The father of Norman bin Bashir, a famous companion. And what had happened is the fact that he had bought a gift for his son. And so the father comes all happy and he has his son and he's coming to the Prophet because he wants the Prophet to, to bear witness for him that he's done a good deed. For buy, in buying something for his son. He comes along and he says, Look, O Prophet of Allah, will you bear witness I've done a good deed, I bought something. You know what the Prophet says to him? Have you bought a gift for your other children? <laughs> Have you done the same for the others? The man says, No, just for my man. The Prophet says, I will not bear witness to an act of injustice then. Right? I will not bear witness to an act of injustice, meaning to be just is the fact that you would have to, why do you have so many misfits? Right? Not only do you have the fact that you, know, you have this over sexualization of society, the growth of pornography, and celebrity culture, these are the diseases that have effect. This is why people are saying that, you know, you people are, kids are losing their innocence at what age? 12. Go back a couple of decades, and there's a four year gap. Right? The 16-year-olds of the 1990s are like the 12-year-olds of today. They know as much, if not more. And you have a corrosion of innocence. Right? If you read people like Sue, Sue Palmer and her book, Toxic Childhood, you, you'd see a lot of these things. It's common sense, in fact. Just don't do anything, just common sense. View the world around you and you see all of this happening. The Prophet of Allah, peace be upon him, would focus on these things. Right? Not to make people lose their self-esteem. How many young people have lack of self-esteem? And because of that, they cut themselves or they kill themselves. I mean, look at the rates of bully side in this country and others. Not only is it the fact that people kill themselves because of bullying, but they do it simply because of other you know, things you'll never imagine. I mean, like a parent has stopped their son from playing computer games, or there is a family disturbance. But the person sees it good enough to hang themselves. I wrote an article on this in 2008, right? You know, when there was a lot of cases. Now there's much more. 
many, many cases. And you know, we all have, we are, Allah made us on earth khalif. Allah made us caretakers on earth. Right? We need to look at the problems that human beings face. Sometimes it's simply that fat people don't get enough love. Right? That's true. They're not loved enough by their parents. They're not loved enough by their siblings. There's envy in, in sibling relationships. Because you have, you know, one sibling who is favored, loved, and then the other who is not loved as much. And all these things have an effect on the human psyche. They affect a human being in how he grows or she grows up. Right? Justice means being just to all. Not being unfair to others. That is the way the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said. That is the way that Allah instructs us, instructs us in the Quran. So I wanted to add that. Uh, I mean, you also have, if you read Dave Grossman's book on killing, the psychological effects of war and the flood effects of that, I'm speaking so fast, it makes me The psychological effects of killing in war and society. He looks at this. You know, like now, for example, what do you have? I mean, Martin Luther King, we remember him for his bravery and courage. What did he say? He says, you have guided missiles and you have misguided men. They called their wars, what? Clean wars, surgical operations, as if it's some kind of happening in the hospital. Surgical operations, euphemisms. We're living in an age of euphemistic language. Hitler called his operation for killing mentally handicapped children, what did he call it? Charitable foundation for institutional care. Euphemistic language, and we have the same thing today. Right? We're going to hunt these terrorists. You know, uh, come on, come on, people. If you took any lessons, if you actually studied what happened in 1968 in Vietnam in the Nilai Massacre, or maybe you wouldn't, in fact, because there was a time lag, wasn't it? So the information began to filter in by what time? June 1969. What had happened? America landed on the moon. <laughs> So nobody wants to remember what happened in, in Milai. The sodomizing of women, killing them, raping them, butchering their people to death were just innocent peasants living in farms. Right? But you wouldn't care because you're just more concerned about the spectacle, the entertainment industry telling you what? People have landed on the moon. You would wave your flag in celebration, but what about those hundreds of people who have just been brutally massacred? Right? You know, we have high points in media. Virginia Tech 2006, April the 16th, you would remember those 33 innocent victims of Virginia Tech school shooting. You'd remember the many that came after them. But would you remember the discourse of other nations, other societies, brutally massacred, killed, starving to death because they're paying debt to the World Bank? But they're starving to death. I mean, there's so many other issues. Right? Being a champion of justice meaning means not simply caring about your own injustice. It means having a, a broad mind and framework. You can see other things happen. Right? So, you know, a pilot will fly his F-16 fighter jet over a people and drop a bomb from where? An altitude. He's so high up. He can't even see what he's doing. He can't even see the decimation and the mess because by the time that anything happens he's miles away in his fast super jet right now Dave Grossman asks a question you give that pilot a knife or a gun and you petition him to go down to earth where there is no altitude you're face to face with your victim and you ask that person to stab one child to death that's it rather than pressing the button and you're just destroying agriculture, wildlife, you're blowing up wells, killing human beings, centers of worship, institutes, mosques, churches, schools, all of that. Just go and kill and stab one human being, one child on earth when you're not at an altitude. Could you do it? It becomes far more difficult. Why? Because there are now phases of, uh, you know, you have to deal with yourself, your conscience. You will see the person beg for Beg for his life. Don't kill me because my mother is dying of cancer and there's nobody to look after my mother, so I and don't kill me. Right? You remember the sacrifice of Maxillian Colby in the Nazi Holocaust. 
Right? How can it be that we have one rule there and another rule there? I mean, that is unjust. Right? The Catholic Church canonized Maximilian Kolbe for what? For being a martyr saint. Because when someone escaped from the, the concentration camp and the Nazis had this rule, ten people have to pay for it for, with their life. And he wasn't selected. But somebody else was. And, but the person cried out, no, don't kill me because I have wife and kids. Maximilian called me and said, I'll take his place. I mean, what a hero in the world of hero. I mean, that is, a, that is a great thing. And he took his place and he was killed. Starvation, he was killed off. And then later the Catholic Church canonized him as being a, a martyr saint. How could it be that you, you would petition for, we would salute and commend the petitioning in one, at one point, but not the other one? <laughs> How can it be? Because the discourse is different. Because the discourse is different. And that is our fault. The Holocaust is not about man's inhumanity to Jews, as people like Eli Wiesel would love to tell it. No. It's man's inhumanity to man. So I had Joe Mayo, who survived Auschwitz, wrote his book, End of Judaism and Ethical Religion Betrayed. What, with the prologue, what is the first quote he has? The quote of Rabbi Hassel, I think from 2nd BC or 3rd BC, saying what? Never do unto others what you would not like done unto yourself. And that is, that is a whole Torah. So that is a whole Torah. Right? So, and what does he say? He says, it can't be fair that what was done unto us when the Jews were called, you know, the Ubar mentioned, the under men, and the, the Untar mentioned, under men, and you had the Ubar mentioned, upper men, the, the Nazis, the Aryan species. <laughs> right? But now you're doing the same thing to the Palestinians. Those vermin that you were once called by the Nazis, you now call the Palestinians. Those homes that were ransacked and dispossessed and taken from you, those shops that were burnt and destroyed in the night of long nights in Nazi Germany are the same things that happened to the Palestinians. It cannot be. That is not just. That is something that is so warped. You couldn't believe human beings could do that. You're supposed to learn a lesson from your injustice, never do unto others what you never like done unto yourself. And that is what the Quran teaches us, that is what the Prophet taught us. Right? Even if you have to go without, you would want to always maintain justice. And so in conclusion I would simply emphasize, never live in an altitude. Never be arrogant, never be boastful. Right? But always live with that sense of empathy, have empathy. What a kind of, what a lost thing in the world today, having simple empathy. This is why I, you know, if you guys have young nephews and nieces or young siblings, one of the best ways, if you follow the model of Howard Zinn, who died in 2010, and he was a great mind, and he has a thing, him and his team have a thing called the Zinn Education Project. You guys should check it out. One of the things is interior monologue. You might remember that from like one or two classes in the GCSE years. In, in model of writing, <laughs> achieving social imagination through interior model of writing is one of the best things I can tell you because I teach in English. And we've just spent the last two weeks writing monologues as if you were Sophia Scholl before the live execution, and you wouldn't believe 11 year old kids what emotions they have. <laughs> you wouldn't believe. Kids, while I never say anything in class, and now they're writing about from a monologue perspective, and they will. And, amazing things about justice and about injustice, things would come out. And we're losing that because we've stuck computer gaming in the face of young people and movies. And there's hardly any literacy in the reading and there's a host of other problems, but I've run out of time, so I'm going to now conclude. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that very, very, very um, I've, I've been signal that there are some questions in the audience, so I think Sabo, you've got them? So I'll repeat the question. Uh, you touched upon how little influence we have on the international political level. Um, what role do you think Um, with that question to the B, I think it's trying to, in terms of 
Some people they think that it's because I was too old. She said I wasn't too old, I was in my 40s, but they have 